validations are extremely important when building internal developer platforms or any platforms for that matter. They serve two primary purposes. They help us ensure that users' requests are valid before they are processed by the platform and they make user experience better. The problem, however, is that people mix those two all the time. One is ensuring that something is valid and the other is improving users' experience without guaranteeing validity of the requests. The first group are real, let's say, policies, while the other is just UX. Let me give you a few examples and you tell me which is which. This is a web UI which has some fields set as required, forcing users to fill in those that must have some values. It also has other types of validations like those in scaling max and scaling min fields that force users to put a value greater than or equal to two. If any of the values in that form is not correct or is missing, users cannot proceed. Now, does that qualify as policies that ensure that only valid requests are sent to the platform? Hmm? Here's a different example, this time with a custom-made CLI-like script. If I try to build an image without specifying the tag, I get the message that it is a required argument. Arguably, I could have made that a bit better output message. Still, the point is that images in this scenario cannot be built without tags. So, the CLI prevented users from doing that. Does that qualify as policies that ensure that only valid operations are performed? Hmm? How about cube control? If we, for example, try to apply a manifest to the namespace that does not exist, we get the message error from server, etc., etc., namespace is B team not found. Assuming that in this scenario, Kubernetes is the platform, does that qualify as a policy that ensures that only valid requests are passed through? Hmm? There are cases where we cannot validate input, like for example, in the case of Git. Let's say that I would like to push a manifest to Git so that Argo CD or Flux picks it up and synchronizes modified resource manifests into the cluster. So if we add, commit and push changes, we get no message except that the push was successful. We could, at least in theory, validate that what was pushed is correct, but I doubt that we could do that in practice given that anything could be inside that commit. Here's the last example I prepared. This is Argo CD UI that is trying to synchronize the previous commit to the cluster. If you take a look at the silly demo app claim, we can see the message that it is forbidden because some validating admission policy says that resource is not allowed to be synchronized into the cluster. Is that a policy that assures that only valid requests are synchronized into the cluster that acts as a platform? Hmm? Among all those examples, only two are actual policies that prevent incorrect inputs into the platform, and neither of them are enforced by the tool we used. When we executed kube control apply, the message that the namespace does not exist did not come from kube control, but from the cluster itself. Kube control has no idea which namespaces exist and which don't. It sent a request to Kubernetes API which responded with though shall not pass. Similarly, the message we saw in Argo CD does not come from Margo CD. It has no idea what are valid and what are invalid resources. Instead, just as Cube Control, it sent a request to Kubernetes API, which again responded with, you cannot do that, go away. The only thing Argo CD did was to show us the message it received as the response from Kubernetes API. The examples from the port web UI and the custom CLI are client-side validations. They improve user experience since they help them see the issue sooner rather than later, but they do not prevent users from doing what they should not do. Now, that sentence might sound confusing. After all, if we did not fill in the required fields or we did not put the correct values, the web UI will not let us submit data. Well, that is technically correct. That sentence is based on a wrong assumption. It assumes that there is only one interface that can be used with the platform. More often than not, that is not true. The fact that we allow users to use that web UI to interact with the platform API does not mean that there are no other paths available. Having a web UI does not mean that people cannot synchronize the desired state into the cluster, the platform, using GitOps, let's say. That web UI could be sending requests directly to Kubernetes API, or it might be pushing manifests to Git so that Argo CD or Flux synchronize them in the true GitOps 
fashion. If the web UI can push changes to Git, something else or someone else could do that as well, just as I did earlier. Someone else might be interacting with the cluster using a CLI like Cube Control. Heck, someone could be using CURL to talk to it. The point I'm trying to make is that there can be an infinite number of ways one can interact with an API, so we cannot rely on a single one of those ensuring that requests are valid. We could, at least in theory, put validation in all the possible tools that might interact with an API, but that would be silly. That would never end since we would need to implement the same set of validations over and over and over and over again, only to discover that it is impossible to fight against infinity. All in all, the only way to run reliable and safe validations is to have processes that do that on the right side of the API. Instead of trying to add them to every single tool that interacts with an API, we can instruct the API itself to validate incoming requests no matter where they're coming from and depending on those validations, let them pass or reject them. Now, does that mean that we should not validate anything inside web UIs or CLIs or whichever other mechanism we might have to interact with an API? The answer to that question depends on the user experience we want to create. Here's an example. Inside my cluster, I might have a policy that validates that the specific field or a specific kind of a resource is a number and that it is greater to or equal to two. That would be functionally the same validation as the one we saw in the web UI earlier. If the data from that form was submitted to the API, API would reject it if the value of that field does not match the rules. Still, from the UX perspective, it is easier to get that feedback while we are typing the value than to wait to click the button and get the response from the server. That's user experience and not reliable validation of the input. So there is user experience and there are policies, or to be more precise, ultimate validations that inputs are correct. Implementation of UX validations depend on the tool we are working with and might need to be implemented in multiple places. The real validations are those performed by APIs when they're deciding whether to process or reject requests. If you can do only one of those, do the latter, the validations by the API. That does not mean that UX is not important, because it is, and you should certainly make user experience good. Still, if we cannot do both, API is where we should focus. Luckily, in case of Kubernetes, there is a mechanism to do just that baked into it. It's called Admission Controller Webhooks, which can validate any individual request sent to the API. In the past, we had to use third-party solutions like Caverno and OPA to implement those webhooks. Now, however, we don't necessarily need those anymore since Kubernetes now comes with its own implementation of policies based on admission controllers. That's what we'll explore today. We'll see how we can use validating admission policy to validate requests coming into the API with the goal to enable users of our Kubernetes-based platform to do the right thing. Here's an example of a typical set of resources we might have to run an application in Kubernetes. That's a deployment, an ingress, and a service. Normally, our applications would be more complicated than that, but for the sake of the demo, that should be enough. Now, if you execute kube control, apply, we can see that the deployment, the ingress, and the service was created, even though we might not want to allow them to be created. Now, Let's say that we would like to have a rule that says that each application needs to have at least two replicas for availability and performance reasons. How could we ensure such a rule is enforced? Should we create a rule that allows only deployments that have spec replicas value set and that the value must be greater than one? Well, we cannot do that since there are many ways how we could get multiple replicas of an application in Kubernetes. Aside from defining the number of replicas in the deployment resource, we could use horizontal pod auto scaler instead. If you do, it would do the scaling depending on metrics. However, we might choose Keda instead, which also does automated scaling, but provides many more options to define the conditions that result in scaling. So, we do not necessarily know how one might fulfill the requirement that an application must have multiple replicas and therefore cannot enforce a policy. Now, we could say that everyone must, must use horizontal pod out scaler. If you do that, we still could not create a policy based on the mission controller webhooks since they are fired for each resource individually. 
when a request to create or update the deployment is sent to Kubernetes API, there is no guarantee that HPA was not already created or will be created afterwards. Kubernetes is all about eventual consistency, so we cannot be sure that HPA is created before the deployment, so we cannot define a policy that prevents creation of deployments that do not have matching HPA. We cannot do it. The solution to that problem and quite a few others is to create our own abstractions. We can, for example, create our own application CRD that will expand into deployment service, ingress HPA, or anything else we might need to run an application. If we do that, we will accomplish at least two objectives. First, we'll make a user-friendly interface developers can use. That, however, is not the subject of this video. The second objective is that we can define policies that allow or disallow certain capabilities without worrying whether those capabilities are implemented by one, two, or any other number of resources. After all, a big part of the work on developer platforms is creating the abstractions that enable users to accomplish certain goals without going crazy. It's all about creating the right level of abstractions, and in Kubernetes, we can do that through CRDs and controllers. Fortunately, there are many tools that help us do that with relative ease. There is Kubevel, Crossplane, Crow, and many others. I will use Crossplane today mostly because that's the project I'm working on. Now, the important note is that today's video is not about Crossplane and that you should be able to create CRDs and controllers with many other tools. We just needed to demonstrate the point I'm trying to make, okay? Let's remove the resources we created earlier and start over. Here's an example of an application definition we'll use. Over there, we're defining only the things that matter, like the ID and the type of the application, and a few parameters like the namespace, the image, the tag, and a few others. That is functionally the same as what we saw before. If you apply it, it will create a deployment, an ingress, and a service. The major difference is that creating a policy that, for example, prevents deployment of an application that does not have multiple replicas will be much easier. As I already mentioned, the fact that a single resource is much more user-friendly than having to define multiple low-level Kubernetes resources is not important since that's outside of today's scope. Let's confirm that we can indeed apply that resource and that it composes the same resources as before. And that's it. Now that we have the abstraction we can work with, we can finally create the policy we talked about. But before we do, let's remove that claim first. Let's take a look at the policy I prepared. The first resource is the validating admission policy with two validations. The first one checks whether scaling and scaling enable fields have values, and if they do, whether scaling enabled is set to true. That's the policy, as the name of the field suggests, that ensures whether scaling is enabled. The second validation checks whether scaling min field has the value that is greater than one, meaning that the minimum number of replicas is two. Both of those applications are applied only to create and update operations of up claims resource. The second resource in that manifest is validating admission policy binding that will deny creation of up claims if they do not match the policy and if they are applied to the A team namespace. I won't go deeper into the policy since I already did that in that video over there. What I will say is that now it is GA, meaning that it is available out of the box in all Kubernetes clusters, starting with version 1.30. So there is no need to install any third-party applications like Caverno, PA Gatekeeper, or others. That does not mean that I think that validating admission policy baked into Kubernetes is better than, let's say, Caverno, but only that it is already in your cluster and that you might want to check whether it meets your needs before reaching for other solutions. Another note is that since we are using an abstraction, up claim, instead of working with all the individual resources, we don't need to worry how will scaling be done, but only that the values and instances of that abstraction are correct. Okay, let's apply that policy and see whether we can still apply the claim we used before. This time we can see that the API did not let us pass. When we send the request to apply that resource, it came back to us saying that spec parameter scaling enabled must be set to true. That's awesome, since that means that we don't have to care anymore whether someone applies resources through Cube Control or Argo CD or Port or Backstage or any other tool. That's not our concern anymore, since that validation happens independently of what or who sends requests to the API. The only thing missing is to create RBAC that disallows creation of anything but up claim resource, otherwise people will still be able to circumvent that policy by creating something else. I will leave RBAC for some other time and 
For now, assume that you know how to set it up. Now, let's fix the problem by adding scaling enabled, set to true to the manifest and try to apply it again. It is still failing. Kubernetes API still does not allow us to pass through, but this time for a different reason. We need to set scaling min to a value greater than one. So let's do just that. We'll change the scaling min to two, two, and apply the manifest again. This time it worked. It passed all admission controller validations and is now applied to the cluster. Behind the scenes, Crossman expanded that claim into a deployment and ingress a service. And since we enabled scaling, a horizontal pod out to scaler. We can confirm that by listing all resources and ingresses in the A team namespace. Okay, there you go. Now you know what to do with validations in your developer platform. Move them into the API. That way validations will be enforced no matter who or what sends requests to that API. Once you're done with policies, feel free to work on UX of the web UI or CLI or whatever else you're building on top of that API. Just remember that validations over there are not reliable, but only ways to improve user experience. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.